The Bible is a part of the Christian faith. It's a part of any Christian church. The Bible is read, taught, studied. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can say about the Bible. Uh, it's a complicated book. Uh, it is also not a book, so that makes it complicated when you call it a book and it's not a book. It's really a series of books, a series of writings that stand together and then also stand apart. Uh, There's some things in the Bible that are pretty simple. So it is simple yet complicated. One of the things that's complicated about it is, is where, am, where am I in the story when I open up the Bible and I'm going to start reading it? I would challenge you that the best way to read the Bible is a book at a time. If you read the Bible a verse at a time, you can get in really bad trouble because uh, you can make any one verse say whatever you want it to say. Uh, and even with the chapters, usually not enough. So the best way to do that is a book at a time. We're in a series called The, book, the Good Book, where we're looking at the 40, uh, 40 significant chapters in the Bible. Not the 40 most important, but 40 significant chapters. Uh, we've looked at uh, five in the book of Genesis and uh, three in Exodus, one in uh, Judges, one in 1 Samuel. Uh, today we're going to be in the Job and Psalm and Proverb part. But just let, let me help show you, in case you don't know, on how the Bible is put together. The Old Testament, the books are arranged according to the type of literature that it is. So in the first five books of the Bible is the law. And you have books like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These are the stories of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph then you get into Exodus through Deuteronomy. You got the story of Moses and the children of Israel and the sacrificial system being introduced and uh, all kinds of wanderings and all kinds of things that happen. That. And then we get into the history books. The history books start with Joshua, go through Esther. Uh, First and Second Kings is about the kings. And that, and that, that's simple, right? So you don't have to, you're not really worried about that. And then when you are when you get to First and Second Chronicles, it seems like it's just kind of a repeat of First and Second Kings, and it kind of is. Uh, Ezra's Ezra's story, Nehemiah's Nehemiah's story, Esther's Esther's story. So you have these history. And so in here you get the story of Joshua and Gideon and Samson and Ruth and David. Uh, some prophets like uh, Nathan and Samuel and Elijah and Elisha. And then you get a story like Nehemiah where he's going back to rebuild the wall in, in uh, Jerusalem and in, in Israel. And you get a book like Esther, and Esther is a history book. And the thing that makes Esther really unique is the only book in the Bible that does not mention somebody. Do you know who that is? God. God is not mentioned in the book of Esther at all. Yet we find it in uh, our Bible. So the Bible is simple in some ways, and it's complicated in some ways. So where we are in the story is today, we're going to be looking at five chapters in the poetry section or in the wisdom literature. And here you have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Three Psalms, Psalms 23, Psalms 51, Psalms 139, and then Proverbs 1. These are four of the five that we're going to look at today, except for I'm not going to talk about any of those four chapters. I'm going to make some videos this week. You can watch those on the app, and I'll, I'll hit some of the highlights of those chapters this week. In our remaining time this morning, I want to talk all about the book of Job. Uh, Job is a significant story. It is a heavy story. It is a weighty story that brings in all kinds of things that we need, I think, that we need to be aware of. So I want to read Job chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. So here we go. There was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. And when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, that's quite a, that's quite a party. Job would purify Job. 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 
Oh, what pure, I've done that in every single service. Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man on all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity and fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and, and take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting in the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabans raided us, they stole all the animals and killed the farmhands. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. When he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, if you're not following along, what is happening here is slowly Job is realizing that all of his wealth has been taken away. In our today's world, it would be like you had four or five different accounts with money in it, and you go to one and it's gone, and you go to another one and it's gone, and you go to another one and it's gone. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with his news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief, then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. And all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. That's quite a first chapter, huh? In this story goes on, Satan goes back, if you, you read, and I really would encourage you to sit down and try to read the book of Job in one setting. It's 42 chapters, it's a commitment, it's going to, be, it's going to take you longer than Psalms 23, so it's going to take you a while, but I really encourage you to do that. So what happens next is Satan says, oh, the reason that he won't curse you is because he's physically okay, you wouldn't allow me to touch that, and then God removes that, and so uh, he gets all of this disease and boils and sores and all kinds of things, and Job still doesn't. And then we go into where his wife uh, tells him to curse God and die. He has these three wonderful friends that show up and tell Job that the reason all of this is happening is because he's been a terrible man. And they have this dialogue that goes back and forth. And then at the end of the story, Job is made twice as wealthy as he ever was because he had remained faithful. And that is the story of Job. Now, Job brings in all kinds of questions, primarily the question of why. Why would God do this? Why would God allow this? This makes no sense. This doesn't seem fair. What we're really asking when we ask these why questions is why does God allow good things to happen to bad people? And you don't really care about Job or Job however, whatever you want to call him. But what you do care is about your life. And you want to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. You want to make sure that your life is not turned upside down. You want to make sure you don't lose everything. You want to make sure that your kids are protected. You, don't, you, you, you worry that about your own self, and then you worry about that around all of the people that you love. So we're going to ask this question, why, why does God allow this? Why do bad things happen to good people? Asking why is rarely helpful. Almost never. Let's say you were to go out and you were to climb a tree 
And as you were enjoying the tree, you fell out of the tree and broke your arm. You know it's broke because it's going in a direction that it is not supposed to go. And so you go to the hospital and you walk in and they, they put you in the room and the doctor comes in and the doctor looks at you and says, oh, you have a broke arm. Yes, doctor, I know that. That's why I'm here. Well, why were you climbing the tree? Why didn't you have safety precautions? Maybe he's a really philosophical doctor. Why is the tree there to begin with? What would you do? You would go find another doctor because all you care about is getting my arm fixed. So you can ask all the why questions you want about the story of Job, and they're not going to be very helpful. Or we can look at the story of Job and say, what is it that I can learn? What is it that is God trying to teach me by sharing with me Job's story? So here's a couple of things. The first one is this. Satan is a problem. You, you can't get very far in Job's story without Satan showing up. And Satan is a problem uh, on a couple of different levels. The first level and the primary level in our culture that Satan is a problem is this. Most people don't believe he exists. Most surveys say about 90 to 95 percent of the population believes in God or at least a higher power. Less than 50% believe in a physical, real Satan. Most people don't believe Satan exists. Satan is throughout Scripture. He shows up in the beginning, he's in the middle, and he's in the end. He was a very act, he plays a very active role in the life of Jesus. Satan is real. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change the fact that he's real. The best and most important problem, Satan problem, that the average person has is they don't believe that he exists. It has been said by many people in many ways. Satan does his best work when you don't believe he exists. Satan is a problem because he is three primary things. The first primary thing he is is an accuser. We see that in Job chapter 1. He says it's it's named Satan the accuser shows up in the heavenly court. Zechariah chapter 3, 1 says this. It says, then the angel showed me Yeshua, also known as, uh, also the name of Joshua there, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser Satan was there at the angel's right hand making accusations against Yeshua or Joshua. Satan is is an accuser and he's constantly going to be accusing you going to make you believe all kinds of things. He is also a liar. In John chapter 8, Jesus is saying this in verse 44. For you, he's talking to a group of people. He says, for you are the children of your father, the devil. So he's calling them sons of Satan. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning, go all the way back to Cain and Abel. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. Satan is a liar. And he's going to try to get you to believe all kinds of lies. And he's going to come at you with lie after lie after lie after lie. He's also a destroyer. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 11. Peter's saying, stay alert. He's talking to Christians here. He's saying, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. Now go back in Job chapter 1. We just read it. When God asked Job, uh, asked Satan, where you been? And Satan's answer is, I've been roaming. I've been going around looking. It says, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stay, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. And that is the good news. We do not have to give in to Satan. We can Defeat him with the power of Christ. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. There's Job's stories all over the place. 
in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. What's Peter doing? He's warning us. He's saying, listen, Satan's out there and he's a destroyer and that's what he's about and he's going to try to destroy your life in any way that he can. That's what he is going to do. He's an accuser, he's a liar, and he's a destroyer and that's what he does. He accuses, he lies, and he destroys. The story of Job includes Satan and so does mine. The story of Job includes Satan, and so does mine. Satan is a part of your story. Satan is a part of your day. Has always been and will be until he's finally defeated. Satan is a part of Job's story, and he is a part of ours. It's three primary statements that go all through Scripture. Things are not as they seem. I have an enemy, and I have a role to play. And in the story of Job, these three things are very prevalent. Things are not as they seem. There's a heavenly court that is in progress. Things are not as they seem. I have an enemy, and I have a role to play. Your story has an enemy my youngest daughter, Amelia, many of you know Amelia. Some of you are new to our church, and you may not know Amelia, but Amelia is a special gift. And she loves the Golden Knights. And this past Tuesday night, we got to go to see a, a, a game again. And this one was special because it was a celebration of her 16th birthday. And mom got to go. First time mom's got to go to a game. And a friend got to go with her. And halfway through the second period, she wanted to leave because she needed to go home and rest, because we found out on Wednesday morning she had the flu. And I remember driving home. We missed the third period on Tuesday night, which was actually a blessing from God. <laughs> but I remember thinking, you yeah, know, what's the deal? And this is what I heard. Even Amelia has an enemy. Every story, including Yours has an enemy. Another thing that jumps out at me when I look at the story of Job is this. There is a court theme that runs throughout the Bible. And we see it very prevalent here in the life of Job. Satan shows up to this heavenly court and is having a conversation with God. And this whole story unfolds. There is a heavenly court it runs all throughout Scripture. There's a book that's called Judges. It's made up of men who, and women who judged. There's the judgment of God. Jesus is referred to as our advocate, our lawyer. The Holy Spirit is referred to as counselor, as a counselor of law. And the gift of salvation and God's grace and mercy to us is so that we can be declared not guilty. Isn't that the one thing, if you ever had to go to trial, isn't that the one thing that you would want to hear? It didn't care what went in the, in, the, in the arguments. It didn't matter what the lawyer said. The only thing you would want to hear from the jury is what? Not guilty. So this theme of a court runs all throughout Scripture. Third thing is this. God likes dialogue. God likes dialogue. And when you read chapter 1 of Job, and you read it slowly, you see that God's asked, he, he asked a question. Where, what you been doing? Now, this wasn't for information. He knew what he was doing. Same way he asked Adam and Eve in the garden. Where you been? Where you hiding? It wasn't an informational question. He's trying to engage in a dialogue. And then and Satan says, I've been roaming around looking for who I might. He doesn't say that there, but looking for who he might devour. And God says, well, have you checked out my servant Job? Now, there's all kinds of why questions here, all kinds of why questions. But one of the things that we can take out is that God likes dialogue. In fact, God demands dialogue. That's what he demands. 
You enjoy conversations. You need conversations. You are in a constant conversation. So am I. I'm either having a conversation with another human being, or I'm having a conversation with myself, or I'm having a conversation with God. But one of those three things is always happening if I'm awake. Right? Why? Because we're created in God's image, and God loves dialogue. He even has a dialogue with Satan. The fourth thing is Job's life is early in the human experiment. Job's life is early in the human experiment. Job most likely would have been a contemporary with Jacob, alive at the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, around in that particular point in time. Human beings are new to this whole deal, this whole experiment of humans. In Genesis chapter 6, we, we see that God is heartbroken because of the rebellion of the people to the point where he's willing to wipe everybody out with a flood. God knows everything. The angels don't. Satan doesn't. I can just imagine this dialogue, this conversation happening among the angels. Is, is this human thing going to work out? I mean, it doesn't seem to be going so well. Yeah, Abel was, you know, Abel seems to be pretty good. You know, the Noah guy seems to be pretty good. Then there's Abraham, but he's a little sketchy. Okay, there's Job. It's a short list. <laughs> it's a really short list. And, and it, so there, it's early in this deal. So, so what's going to happen here? Is there going to be a faithful people? Is there going to be a remnant? Are people actually going to be faithful? And isn't that the biggest question for you? And the biggest question for me is, am I going to be faithful? Am I going to be faithful to what I say that I believe? Am I going to be faithful to God? And we've talked about the last couple of weeks. Faithful and obedient are two different things. Am I going to be faithful? And then it leads us to really two key questions that I think we have to ask. The first question is this. How do I handle the bad stuff? How do I handle the bad stuff? Because when we read a story like Job's and we get told this story, we look at this and we come at this whole idea of, of what God is doing and why doesn't he intervene and why does it seem like he's removing his, not seems like he removes his protection and all this stuff happens to Job and we're really afraid that that's going to happen to us or happen to our kids and, and we're just so fearful of that. So how do I handle the bad stuff? Because you didn't have to come to church on a, holiday weekend, for me to tell you that bad stuff's going to happen, right? You know bad stuff's going to happen, right? Yet we're surprised every time it does. So, so it's just so shocking to us. It's, it's, it's not to, death is not a funny thing, but it can be a victorious thing. But isn't it funny when someone who's like 92 dies and we ask where they die from? Well, they're 92, <laughs> You know, so, I mean, there's just, stuff's going to come at you. Stuff is coming at you. And, and, and there was those, you know, if you're not currently in a storm, you just came out of one, or you're about to go into one. Life is going to come at you in all kinds of ways. And what do I do? How do I handle the bad stuff? Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, Jesus talking to his disciples, specifically to Peter, who here he refers to him as Simon. He says, Simon, Simon. Anytime Jesus says something, he repeats it. It's like, this is going to be important. It's be like saying, Marty, Marty. Ever do that with someone? You're really trying to get their attention? Marty, Marty. Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. He's talking about Peter and the disciples. Satan has asked to crush you. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented, because God knows everything, and he knew Peter was going to repent, 
from denying him three times. And turn to me again. Strengthen your brothers. Now notice what Jesus didn't say. Satan has asked to sift you, and I told him no. Jesus didn't say, well, some people don't believe in Satan, and they're right. He doesn't exist. And he would never ask to try to destroy you. No. Satan has asked to sift you. And I have prayed that you would not lose your faith. So what do I, how do I handle the bad stuff? I have to be like Job, and I have to remain faithful. Job remained faithful. Job chapter 1. The story kind of gets worse, but kind of doesn't, because in chapter 1, you know, he lost his money. That's one thing. But when you lose your children, for those of us who are parents, are like, well, what else, what else is there? I mean, it's just, it doesn't get any worse than that. And he loses it all. And what does he do? He worships. Says God giving it to me, God can take it away. He worship and he doesn't sin by blaming God. Now here's what most people do, even in church, when life comes at you hard. You stop worshiping and you start blaming God. Instead of being like Job, to remain faithful. And to worship and to not blame God. So I had all handle the bad stuff. The bad stuff's coming. There seems to be a court in the heavenlies where Satan is asking to do stuff. And it seems like God sometimes says, okay, let's see. So how do I help others handle the bad stuff? How do I handle myself? And then how do I help others? Job 42.10 says this, When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as ever before. Isn't that interesting? When did God restore to Job his wealth? When he prayed for his friends who are basically telling him all kind of trash. And Job prayed for them. So how do I help others handle the bad stuff? Number one, pray for them. Number two, tell them you love them. And number three, ask how can you help? So pray for them. Tell them that you love them. They've lost someone in their family. They've lost their job. They're going through a really tough time. The report comes back and it says it's cancer, whatever it is. You pray for them. You tell them that you love them. And then you ask, how can you help? Anything else that you say is dumb. Anything else you say is stupid. Don't say it should give us great relief when we go to a funeral. The pressure's off. Just say, I love you. I don't know what to say. Of course you don't know what to say. There's nothing to say. Just say, I love you. I love you. How can I help? Now, here's the great thing about asking, how can I help? People usually will not give you an answer. And then you're off the hook. <laughs> I asked. God, I asked. You said to pray for him. I'm praying for him. I, I told him I loved him. And I want to, I asked how I could help. Most people won't tell you how they can help. If they do and you can't do what they're asking, then you just say, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I can do. And then you help them in any way that you can. Job is a significant, significant book because of all of the things it puts on the table. Satan. Satan and God having conversations. 
God removing, God putting his protection, God removing his protection. How does Job handle? How does he handle this? How does he handle that? How does he handle the people coming at him? How did, what is it? So many things. In the middle, about the middle of Job, because 42 chapters in Job 19, verse 25, when his wife's telling him to cuss God and die, and his friends are of no help whatsoever, Job says something. Now he's lost all of his wealth, he's lost all of his children. And his body is ravaged with disease. And do you know what he says? Chapter 19, verse 25. But for me, not my wife, not my friends, but for me, my Redeemer lives. And when I place my faith in my Redeemer, and because He lives, because He has defeated the grave, and the tomb is empty, because my Redeemer lives, When I place my faith in him, I can handle whatever comes my way. May we be a faithful people who worship no matter what. Let's pray. Father, this is your truth and We give it to you. We ask you to take it, use it, teach us, help us to be faithful. In your name we pray, amen.